Feast TV is brought to you with the support from Missouri Wines, Caldi's Coffee, Old Time Produce, and the Raphael Hotel. Today it's all about coffee and donuts. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. Chips and salsa, mac and cheese, peanut butter and jelly, some things are just meant to go together. And in this episode of Feast TV, we are exploring the all-American pair of coffee and donuts. And our first stop is in Columbia at Fretboard Coffee, where they make coffee in all kinds of delicious ways. Music and coffee are, for me, the two things that I'm most passionate about. All through college and even high school, I played music and in various bands. At the end of college, I met this woman named Julie, who was a bandmate for a long time and then eventually became my partner and is now my wife. Really, Fretboard Coffee started out of a conversation that she and I had after about a year or two of dating where she was going to grad school and figuring out what she wanted to do with the rest of her life. And we thought, well, if she's going to go and be a professor and she'll probably live in a university town somewhere. And we thought, well, in a university town, there's always going to be an influx of customers. Wouldn't it be great to have a coffee shop, one that has ethically sourced beans, one that has organically produced coffees, one that doesn't use chemicals or pesticides, one that has a lot of choices. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to have a coffee shop that kind of encapsulates all of my interests in coffee and all of my interest in music and kind of brought them together? And my hope was that that would resonate with folks. And so far, it seems to have. This is what we call the B-side half of the cafe. Back here is where customers sit and hang out and do their work or you know, occasionally perform music. And the A-side being the actual cafe itself where we brew all the coffee, roast all the coffee, make all the coffee. We have a fretboard coffee truck that we affectionately call Marilyn. She's got a picture of Marilyn Monroe hanging in there from the previous owner. We found this truck and it was available and we thought, well, this is a little bit more space than we need, but it's actually enough space where we could put in some countertops, put in an espresso machine. And the thinking was that we could kind of turn it into a food truck, but for coffee. Hey, how are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Good, what can I get for you? Uh, can I get a small French press? Absolutely, I'll have that right out. One of the things that we love about Fretboard is that we do all hand-pressed coffee, so even on the truck when we're driving around, we have kind of worked out the best ratios and uh, want to make the best hand-pressed coffee, so we're going to do some nice ground uh, dark Ethiopia in a French press today, and then we're going to bring it out to the world. Hey, I got your French press ready to roll. Awesome, thank you. Absolutely, thanks so much for stopping by. Have a great day. Have a good day. With the truck, we're able to drive out all over Columbia to different places that we wouldn't normally be able to have a presence and meet all these new people and kind of bring our love for coffee and our love for music and our love for community. So now Dave and I are on side A in the actual main part of the coffee shop and before we really get into some of the other processes, I want to talk about the cold brew system. Yeah, let's do it. I never would have thought that single drips of water going onto coffee would extract the coffee in the way that it does. Sure, yeah. So um, the cold brew system, um, there's water on top, coffee in the middle, and then it drips down into the lower portion. The lower temperature of the water makes a lower acid coffee at the end of the day. The downside is that it takes 12 hours to brew a single batch. That's what can make coffee or tea or anything like that too bitter if you extract it too fully. Sure. And so I personally love cold brew because it's not very acidic and I feel like you can really taste the coffee, like the character of the beans yeah. very fully in a cold brew. Absolutely, I, I totally agree. I mean, you, you really get inside the, the coffee in a way that is difficult when it's too hot and, and when it's brewed in different ways. Coffee can be prepared in a number of different ways. Pour over French press, AeroPress, Chemex, cold brew. We've also got the siphon pot, which is my personal favorite. Let's do the siphon pot. Okay. So this is the filter. 
And what happens is you pull this down and that just keeps tension so that as the coffee rises up and during the brew process, it doesn't bring the filter with it. This water is very hot because I took it out of our boiler, which is at about 205 anyway. Um, but as that starts to heat up, the air bubble starts to heat up as well and it starts to expand. So as the air bubble gets bigger and bigger, there's less and less space for the water and it ends up up here. As I've removed the heat, the air bubble kind of starts to cool off mm -hmm. and then he starts to condense. Oh, and then as he starts to get smaller, that actually creates a vacuum. It pulls the coffee back down through this filter and it ends up right back where it started. So it takes a little bit longer than a regular cup of coffee, but not so much longer. And, and I think that the coffee is so much better. So the key to any good latte or any espresso-based drink is really good espresso, and we're gonna go over both how to pull uh, the shot and then also how to combine that with, with milk to make a latte. Awesome. So the first thing we do is we're gonna grind the right amount of coffee for an espresso. I'll give it a little twist. That's called polishing the puck. We're gonna lock this in, and we're gonna let that brew. Is that about right? Yeah, that looks great. And give it a swirl. And I'm going to pour round in circle like that. I already messed it up. It's okay, no, no, you're fine. Pour more quickly than you think. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is more like abstract art, no, I think. I've made so many abstract lattes, <laughs> it's not even funny. It's a great first try. Thank you, good first try. Fantastic. My very first latte art. Nice. That's not terrible. Thank you for teaching me. Sure. Mm. Delicious. It might not look perfect, but it tastes good. For me, what attracts me to coffee shops and coffee shop life is community. I mean, if I had to distill it down into one word. Um, it's all about the artists and jewelers and painters and musicians and all the people that are in this neighborhood that have made this place successful. I mean, I'm just one guy with a roaster and I've been really lucky to find myself in the midst of all these wonderful, talented people who are willing to come in every day and have great conversations about you know everything that's going on in the world, about where they come from, about where their backgrounds are. And so it's like this great social space where everybody comes in to have their beverage of choice, whether that be tea or hot chocolate or coffee or what have you. It's all that interaction with everybody and it's kind of grown beyond just me and what, what my vision is. So you have to pair your coffee with a donut, right? Well, in St. Louis, there's a spot that's making donuts that are almost too good to dunk. We're heading there next. Vincent Van Donuts started out as a truck. Correct, 2013. And then your first location was in Clayton. Correct and now you have this location. I mean, you've grown pretty fast. Yeah. I got kind of obsessed with uh, donuts in 2010. My wife is in the hair industry. We were in Berlin, uh, and Dunkin' Donuts, oddly enough, are huge over there, and all the patisseries and the fancy pastries, and um, there was a lot of neat stuff going on over there and realized that it didn't exist in St. Louis at the time. So the elevated kind of artisanal from scratch stuff is what I wanted to focus on. And that's been kind of what set us apart mm -hmm. this whole time. There are lots of donuts in St. Louis. A lot of donuts. Lot. Yeah, across America there are tons. Oh, absolutely. So how did you develop your recipe to be unique? I've been in the restaurant business for 26 years. I've worked for some really cool people from bars to like, uh, you know, high-end hotels and I was a suit for a while and I got to work for Gerard Craft. Mm -hmm. and so we try to do different things that are inspired by other things in the culinary world and, and the classics are there for a reason too. But we are constantly looking for different inspiration. So which do you think is better, the yeast or the cake? I'm a yeast fan. And how long did it take you to develop that recipe? I've been working, I still work on it. I, I think I've got the yeast one pretty much set. Um, but it took me well over two years to get to where I was even happy with it. That's amazing. So why do you make your donuts square? You get two chances to roll the yeast over. 
the first one when you roll out, you cut it, then you can use the re-roll and you can roll that back out even though it's a little bit thicker at that time and denser. Then you get that last roll and then you're supposed to discard the, the dough. Well, if you cut squares, you only get the perimeter as the, as the, waste. As the excess. Oh, that's okay. great. So donuts are one of those things that you can easily find yourself craving. People bring boxes of donuts into work and they're the, the hero for the day. That's right. You know, it's one of those, you know, grab a donut, have a cup of coffee. You know, so as an eater, I can see being kind of obsessed with the donut. But as a chef, what was it about the process that made you love it so much that you spent two years just developing yeah. your first recipe? I don't know. I got so obsessed with it because, like, to the point where I couldn't even go five minutes throughout the day without thinking about it. <laughs> My wife finally said, "You know, you got to do something about that. Like, if you leave me alone, like, stop talking about it and do something, or else move on." Yeah. So I was constantly working on it at night, and I'd do it, and I'd use family, and I'd even talk with other pastry chefs and kind of pick their brains and whatnot because. It's a self-taught thing. I never went to culinary school. I never learned this stuff, so I kind of just taught myself how to do it. And so two shops and a truck later. That's right. I mean, the consistency is huge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you should be able to come to the Grove. You should be able to go to the truck. You should be able to go to Clayton and get the same product. These donuts are awesome. They really are. I mean, these yeast donuts, the square ones, they have a slight chew to them. Yeah. And a really nice pillowy quality. And then because all of the toppings are made by hand, the flavors are really, really pure. So you're not using extracts. Right. You're not using anything fake. As long as you have a good base, then you can just build on top of it. Isn't that true of everything in life, essentially? I, I suppose so, yeah. So yeah. donuts. That's actually right. are donuts a metaphor are life. for life. That's right. Donuts are life. <laughs> Can we get back in the kitchen and see yeah, the please. rest of these donuts yeah. come together? Absolutely. All right, let's go. I kind of worked my way into the position. Initially when I came in, I did not have any work experience in baking. And I was actually pretty interested in the decorating process. I like to make my food look really nice and neat and just like pretty and presentable. But you know, there's a whole lot that goes into it before we get to that final pretty looking donut. And I had to learn all that pretty much from the ground up. So here we have liquid egg. This is gonna make up a good chunk of our recipe. Most of our dry ingredients are here in this bowl, along with our shortening. We're gonna toss this in the big mixing bowl. Whenever you throw all that flour in there, it's gonna you know, collect all the liquid up and uh, turn into a nice big giant ball of dough. One batch for us typically makes 160, 170 donuts. The bread is pretty thick and heavy compared to most donuts, which I personally prefer because it doesn't feel like I'm biting into fluff. It tastes like I'm actually biting into good bread. The majority of our toppings are all made pretty much from scratch. So, you know, we have to do all that in one night plus make the actual dough itself. Uh, we do all the cooking overnight and then Hopefully we're done by two in the morning. Sometimes it runs later. If we have 500 donuts to make in a night, then sometimes we might not get out until 4 a.m. So the hustle bustle of the day has died down. It's about seven o'clock at night. It's getting kind of dark outside and this is when the donuts are made. That's right. The process can take up to 12 hours. We start at 6 p.m. at night. Uh, and then sometimes they're walking out of here at you know, 5.30 a.m. You mix the dough, you've got to cut it, you've got to sheet it, it has to proof and it ferments basically. And then you fry it and then you have to glaze it. My favorite donut is the chocolate chip cookie, which is cheesecake glaze with typical streusel, chocolate chips, and ganache. There's something very comforting to know that while we're sleeping, all tucked in our beds, That's right. you guys are here making the donuts. <laughs> I love That's that. That's what we do. So I have my donuts and my coffee, and we've seen the eye-opening side of things. Let's dim the lights a little bit and head to Kansas City to see where coffee and cocktail culture meet. We're here in Kansas City at Thou Mayas where coffee and cocktails collide. But before we meet Bo, one of the co-founders, let's head to the roastery and see where all those beautiful beans begin.
So first off, how did all of this come about for you? Well, uh, my dad used to roast coffee in the 90s, and so I kind of grew up in high school with him always getting new coffees, roasting new coffees, and so that was kind of interesting. And then once I graduated college, he actually got me a, a little home roaster for a graduation present. Really? Yeah. So he was roasting coffee for fun, or yeah. did he do it professionally? No, not professionally. He was on a quest for like the best cup of coffee, and somebody said, you know you can roast at home. And so he found a home roaster, and then so for about seven years, he would just roast at home. And then when I was off at college, he would send me care packages uh, with all this coffee roasted at home. So everybody at college, like, I became better friends with people just because of that coffee that I was able to get. So. Well, no wonder you ended up in this profession. You have this cafe, so obviously you're supplying your cafe, but you sure. also have wholesale clients and then a subscription. Right. How that works is basically we have wholesale customers that we provide coffee to that they can either uh, serve at their coffee shop, bakery, anything like that, or if they just want to have our 12 ounce bags to put on the shelf. And then we have the online model that we continue to push and from there you're able to get the subscription so you can basically choose, yep, yeah, once a week I want one bag, two bags, whatever it is. And then we just basically produce everything here to order. So once they order, we get it, we roast it and we ship it the same day. Oh, so it's the freshest coffee. You could possibly get. That's amazing. Yeah. So if I'm going to drink a cup of Valmeas coffee, what's different about it than maybe somebody else? Sure. So at our core, what we try to do is hit these main uh, profiles that we think most people are looking for. We basically have smooth operator, which we're going to say is smooth, easy to drink, right down the middle. We have wild child, which is going to be a little bit brighter, a little more complex. And we have bold to go, which is going to be basically a darker roasted coffee. And then we have alter ego, which we use for our house brew and espresso. And then we have a decaf option. So we have these five coffees that are named the same thing and throughout the year as we get fresh harvests of coffee, we can basically find something that's going to fit that profile. So when you come back in a year, it may not be the same coffee, but you know exactly what you're going to get because you're looking for that particular profile. So we make it very, very easy. So kind of by branding it and positioning it right. with the coffee experience that somebody wants to have, sure. that helps people connect with the brand. Yeah, we, we took a cue from the beer industry because they don't tell you what grains or hops. They tell you this is an IPA or this is a stout or whatever it is. And, and if you trust that company and you've had it enough, you know what to expect from that. Even though the ingredients might change over time, you expect that particular brand and that particular item to get the thing that you want. And so we basically were like, well, that's easy. We should do that. Use beautiful packaging and people will get exactly what they want. This beautiful roaster. Mm -hmm. You said it's made in America. Yep, in Idaho. Really? Yeah, very nice. So, especially working from what we had before, we kind of liken it to before we had a 92 Camry that would get you from A to B, and then we <laughs> upgraded to a, a brand new Dodge Charger. So, it was a huge step up in quality and, and volume for us. If you've never roasted coffee or seen the process, it's actually pretty simple. I mean, all you're doing is applying heat to the surface of these beans, which have been fermented and dried. So really what differentiates you is the way that you control the roast, and then also the quality of the beans that you're starting exactly. with, right? That's right. So take me through this machine and how it works. Sure. So we start with the green coffee beans, and basically inside is this rotating drum that has uh, fans in it. Once you put the coffee in there, it rotates in here under a certain amount of heat and then a certain amount of airflow through the drum. And so basically we control those variables of heat and airflow over time. Once it's roasted in there from you know 12 to 16 minutes, it drops into this cooling tray, this agitates it, and then there's airflow that will cool it down. And from there, it's ready to get packaged. So when you met Bill, what was it that inspired you guys to get into the coffee business? The motive and the heart about what we do is like, it's all about connections, it's all about relationships. We happen to just love these great drinks that are facilitating that. The drinks are almost a vehicle yeah. to create yeah. a point of connection for the city. Being able to celebrate that in a physical space, that was really important to us. A lot of people say, what is thou mayest? Um, for us, it's a movement, and explaining that a little bit, it's from John Steinbeck's book called East of Eden, it means the way is open. This area of town specifically attracts the movers and the shakers and the doers. So when you get all that energy and you're attracting that and it's all in one space, 
you know, the question is, what's gonna come out of that? So when everybody says like, hey, you're the, you're the coffee guy, and I'm like, I run the idea brothel. Uh, <laughs> this is the place where ideas come to like co-mingle, and you can get buzz like either in the AM or in the PM, because some people are most creative in either of those states, you know, and like, let's get something done. It's not just a, you know, let's sit around and talk about it. It's like, now what? Yeah. So that now what is something that is core to the, the movement that we're trying to create. You obviously have your standard lattes and espresso yep. and things like that, but in the evenings you switch over. There is a switch that happens yeah. in, in the mood and the lighting and just the general ambiance and vibe. It's so hard to slam coffee and cocktails together. They're two very separate industries. So people are looking at us and they're like, oh, come now. Like, why would you put, you know, coffee with that? And and you know that, that's a beautiful coffee by itself. And I'm like, but it's even better in this cocktail. And that's why we like this bar side. Is it's, it's, it's allowed us the creativity just to be kind of irreverent with the product. So tell me about the spirit of Kansas City or the spirit of KC cocktail that you have on the list. Yeah, that was a fun one. It has Luxardo. It has lemon. Uh, it has Rieger whiskey and Amaro in it. The coffee's in the Amaro. It's a very coffee forward product. Cheers to the spirit of Kansas City. Now let's head to the kitchen and play with some coffee and donuts. So today I'm going to be making potato donuts. It is a very old fashioned way to make that all American favorite and it's a fantastic way to use up leftover mashed potatoes. And if you've never had a potato donut before, they have something at the density of a cake donut but they're so much lighter and it's almost kind of like the texture kind of straddles yeast and cake donuts. It's a really surprising way to make donuts and they are delicious. You'll be glad you experimented with this. So the first thing I'm going to do is just sift together all of my dry ingredients. Three cups of just regular all-purpose flour. And this is just a standard sieve over a nice big bowl. Baking powder and baking soda go in next. A little bit of salt, nutmeg and cinnamon, and that's it. So I'm sifting this so there aren't any lumps, and then I'm gonna set it aside. Next up, I'm gonna cream my sugar and my eggs. It's just a cup of sugar and two eggs. These look great. You can see it's nice and light, just a kind of a little hint of a ribbon. So these are perfect. So I have three tablespoons of melted butter that I'm going to add in along with some buttermilk, which is gonna add a really nice tang to these donuts. Now I'm incorporating my mashed potatoes. Imagine if you are hosting Thanksgiving and the day after the big meal you make potato donuts for all of your family that stayed over. It's a fun little surprise. So just stir these guys in. You don't want any lumps, so make sure this is thoroughly stirred in. Next step is you're just going to incorporate the wet ingredients with the dry ingredients a little bit at a time so they thoroughly combine. So you want your dough to be sticky, but not too sticky. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my cutting board and I'm gonna turn this out and I'm gonna pat it into a square. So you want to pat the dough out until it's about an inch or so thick, and then 
grab your donut cutter and start cutting your donuts. If you don't have a donut cutter, you can also use two cans. In these, you can fry up as little donut holes if you want to. My oil is heating on the stove, so now I'm gonna go ahead and fry the donuts. I have just neutral oil. You can use grapeseed oil. If you wanna use peanut oil, that's fine. You wanna make sure that your oil is not too hot and not too cold, because too hot, it'll cook too fast, obviously. But if it's too cold, what will happen is all of that oil will just get absorbed into the donut and you'll end up with just kind of an oily, soggy, not great donut, which you definitely do not want. I'm gonna drop in my very first donut. You wanna kind of lift them up off the bottom. They'll wanna stick just a tiny bit and then you'll see they start to float. And all you have to do is keep an eye on them. And when they're nice and golden on the bottom, flip them over and keep frying them until they're golden on the top. And that's it. I love going out for donuts, do not get me wrong, but being able to make them yourself at home and having them turn out like these gorgeous golden pillows, it's a lot of fun. Last donuts coming out of the oil, and now I'm gonna make two kinds of glaze, one with coffee and one with a sweet wine. All you take is a little bit of powdered sugar and then whatever liquid you want to add. This wine happens to be a Moscato from St. James Winery. Wine glaze is finished. And now I'm gonna make a coffee glaze. This is the coffee and donuts episode after all. So you can glaze your donuts in two ways. You can either drizzle or you can dunk. I prefer the dunking method. Just put your donut right there in the glaze, turn it over, and there you go. If you wanna coat the whole thing, feel free. They're your donuts, so do whatever you want. Who knew mashed potatoes could make such delicious donuts? Enjoy.